first question for you is, um, what made you want to start working with Disability Rights Maryland? So oh, that can be a long story or a short story because I've been working in the public interest field and doing civil rights work for over 40 years. I'm wow. actually just getting ready to retire. started out when I went to college wanting to be a social worker and then um, I did a lot of work with people with disabilities, children and education issues, people in asylums, and this was quite a while ago when asylums mm -hmm. still existed, um, and people with intellectual disabilities, and that was after I graduated from college, and what I found is that there was quite a bit of discrimination against people with disabilities, um, and a lack of inclusion, like segregating people. Mm. Um, and so that inspired me to go to law school and fight for civil rights in that way as opposed to being a social worker. And so then when I was in law school, I worked at what's called the PNA, which is We Are Our PNA, Protection and Advocacy Office for People with Disabilities. And we were probably created around the same, well, a little before I was um, going to law school. And so the PNAs were started because there was horrific abuse in um, basically institutions where people with intellectual disabilities and mental health issues were warehoused. Um, and staff ratios were like 50 to 1, and people, mm -hmm. it, w it was horrendous. It was horrendous. And parents were advised, you know. This is where your child has no future in the community. This is where you put them. And people had no idea what was happening in these institutions. So there were a number of exposés. And there's, if you Google it, you can see Geraldo Rivera many, many years ago did an expose of Willowbrook. And mm -hmm. that is one of the... Um, things that started Congress to create the PNA system, the Protection and Advocacy System. So the Federal Congress created the Protection and Advocacy System and funded it and gave it special authority to investigate issues of abuse and neglect, even if you didn't have consent, because many times you couldn't get consent. Yeah. Either the parents or guardians had passed away or couldn't be located or the person couldn't give the informed consent, and so the PNA was given the special fund. So when I was in law school, and there was a PNA in every state in U.S. territory, so there's an organization like Maryland, or Disability Rights Maryland, um, and then we have a national support network that um, supports us. So it's federal legislation that, so, that's, it's a network, and then there's the National Support Organization. And so, and it's a terrific office, and so that was where I interned when I was in law school. I worked mm -hmm. for about two years at the Connecticut p and I was going to school in Connecticut. Yeah. And um, really loved it, um, but then decided to go work for legal aid for a while. So worked at a legal services office for many, many years, and then with my husband moved kind of around the country. We went to Missouri, we went to Arizona, and I worked mm. at the Arizona p &A. and my feeling of all the places that I had worked was that the p &A is the most effective for um, enforcing civil rights for people with disabilities. And also, um, I just have a passion for civil rights for people with disabilities. So, yeah. Meryl PNA has a, a really fabulous reputation. Um, and I was not disappointed when I came there. I've been there for five years as the executive director. And the staff is just fabulous. Um, they're committed, they're talented. Um, and what's unique about the PNA 
is that we can use whatever tools we need. So we do individual cases representing people, and then basically we're a law office. Yeah. Uh, but also uh, a civil rights law office. Yeah. I so that's possible. Yeah, tell me some more about what Disability Rights Maryland does. So what we do is all kinds of advocacy. We get federal funds, state funds, and we do um, advocacy. We'll take individual cases and advocate for a person, and that can entail negotiating with the state. It can entail investigating abuse and neglect. It can... Um, entail getting supports for the person. Yeah. So we have a staff of attorneys, and then we also have what's called advocates, paralegals, similar. Yeah. And um, we'll work together, depending on the case. And then what we can also do is what we refer to as our systemic work. So we can advocate for policies and procedures with the state. There's a lot of um, People with disabilities receive benefits through the feds or through the state. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can advocate for agencies for fair policies and procedures. And if that doesn't work, we can go to court and sue to enforce. There's the Americans with Disabilities Act. And then there's a key U.S. Supreme Court case called mm -hmm. Olmstead. Um, I'm not sure the full name, but you can look it up on the yeah. internet. And basically, that's like the Brown versus Board of Education case for people with disabilities. It really established that people with disabilities, if you're going to um, have them receive services, it should be in the least restrictive environment. Okay. And it's what led to. Um, a lot of deinstitutionalization. There was really a movement when I started practicing, and which continues to this day, of getting rid of and closing down institutions and having people in the most integrated setting possible at the place of their choice, not warehouses and institutions. Yeah. So we can bring lawsuits, or we can go to the legislature. We don't get our state funding, our federal funding does not allow us to lobby. Hmm. So our legislative activities, we have to raise what's called unrestricted funds in order to fund that work. But we have been very effective. Um, for example, last year we got a law passed that bans seclusion and restraint in public schools of people with people well people with disabilities, but overall seclusion and restraint. And there were horrendous cases of students with disabilities being secluded and restrained numerous, numerous, like up to 100 times in a school year, which is traumatic for the student yeah. um, and not very effective in um, dealing with any behaviors that they're trying to do. It's just not, not a good practice. So. That was quite a victory. We started in 2006, an attorney, Leslie Margolis, who's been with us for 37 years, um, started with that legislation in 2006, and it took us till 2022 to get it passed, but we did. So that's also an example of our work. We will yeah. take an issue and continue to advocate on that issue until we succeed. Hmm. That sounds like really cool, and how you advocate through people uh, helping them in a lot of different aspects. Yes, the other thing is, um, when it's civil rights, it's really, um, we feel that people are entitled, like, um, are entitled to have accommodations and it's just people have different needs and so it's not that a, with a, so a person with a wheelchair um, needs a ramp to get into a building but you and I need steps yeah. so it's a, 
matter of making sure that there's equity so that everyone can be included um, and it should be a right, not a privilege. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. Um, so that's really the philosophy of the PNA, and that's why I love working at it, but I also love the people that work there and the amazing results. We really make a meaningful difference in people's lives. And the other thing that we pride ourselves in is working closely with the people we represent. So we're not deciding, um, and some of our lawyers and advocates have disabilities too, but mm -hmm. when we take a case, we're not deciding for um, the people we represent, what kind of relief they should get or what their needs are. We work very closely with them to make sure the relief we're getting meets their needs. Um, so they will come to court with us. They will be involved in negotiations with us. Um, they will come to the legislature and testify. Um, so we work hand in hand. Also, I think a very cool aspect of our organization. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't, you know, a nonprofit probably, um, when you work at public interest nonprofit as an attorney, you're probably paid the least of any attorney, but the rewards are terrific. Next question for you was, um, what do you think the biggest current legal issues for Marylanders with disabilities are facing right now? Say it, it's still the remaining issue is full inclusion. Um, you know, th there's still issues with transportation um, services that aren't adequate. Um, education services mm -hmm. are children are still excluded and not fully included. Um, Health care is not equitable areas that we concentrate in. So we have a housing community inclusion unit. We have a mental health um, unit. And that's the other thing. There's really a lack of um, mental health services, particularly in the community. Um, there's mm -hmm. particularly, I would say, one of the biggest issues right now is that there are children and adults with disabilities, intellectual and mental health issues who are stuck in hospitals. They had a crisis, they were hospitalized, and then uh, are ready for discharge, are ready to go back into the community, um, and there's no services, and so they remain stuck in hospitals for months. Yeah. Um, and it's not a good atmosphere. There's no school for people, there's no activities for people. It's really, you know, a hospital setting. Um, it's not a place to be living. Yeah. And so that's an issue. And just recently, there was legislation passed. I, can, I would say they're stuck in hospital. Um, another case that we have right now um, is for children in foster care, um, there is not appropriate use of psychotropic drugs mm -hmm. for kids with behavioral health issues. So it's just a mishmash, and so we have brought a lawsuit and are negotiating with the state to resolve that problem. We have a lawsuit against the city of Baltimore um, wow. for not having accessible pedestrian right-of-way sidewalks. People cannot get, literally can't, you know, if you use a wheelchair, you can't get down the street or the sidewalks. I don't know if you've ever been in downtown Baltimore, but... Mm -hmm. You got to look sharp on the sidewalk. <laughs> yeah. They're very bumpy and they're not, um, basically the ADA has been the Americans with Disabilities Act, which mandates that, you know, cities be accessible for people and towns be accessible. And that's been there for 30 years. And when we started the lawsuit, only 1.9% of pedestrian right-of-ways were accessible. Hmm. And so we are doing that lawsuit. Um, and if you go to our website, there's a little tab at the top that talks about court cases, and that lists the cases that I'm talking about. Okay. If you want more information about that. Um, and then we are, we have a lawsuit against the 
the Department of Corrections for their treatment of people with serious mental health issues. Um, too many people with mental health issues are in correctional facilities and should not be there um, for behaviors that are related to their mental health condition, but they're treated as crimes. And then the correction system is not equipped to provide appropriate services. The people are kept in segregation for um, almost for, for months, for years, and it's very, very um, traumatizing and really creates more serious harm. And that's not limited to, that's a, a nationwide problem. That's not limited specifically to Maryland. Those are the, the biggest. The biggest issue nationwide really is full inclusion. There seems to be a movement now uh, where people are saying there's all homeless people and people with mental health needs who should be um, forced to receive treatment and that is really just not productive. Mm. And it's a return to the institutions, and our focus is really if you provide appropriate community services um, that are accessible, you know, available to people, that you don't need the institutions. Yeah. So, um, very distressing. I think in New York City they're doing, um, the mayor has talked about that, and it's pretty distressing, and our New York p and is very opposed to that. Yeah. Next question for you was, uh, how can able-bodied Marylanders or just people in general help to alleviate these uh, problems? I think awareness is really important. Um, educate yourself on the needs of people with disabilities. So, um, which with the the internet is quite mm -hmm. you're quite able to do it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of literature that talks about the correct language to use with people with disabilities. Um, TED Talks about, which are really um, great. There's a woman, Judith Human, who recently passed away. Yeah. Um, and I actually have a picture of her on my desk, and you know, people say, "Oh, that was sad." It is sad that she passed away, but. Um, it's her smiling and her spirit is so strong that it just inspires me every day. Yeah. Um, so it's good to, so education first and then, you know, helping get legislation passed, um, being active, you know, politically to make sure that laws and, and ordinances and everything are equitable. I think that's what people can do. Support the PNA. <laughs> Go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, um, so you know what's going on. Most of the people we serve are people without the ability to hire attorneys, you know, are living <coughs> with low incomes at or near the poverty level. Yeah. So, um, but we also try to educate people and help connect them with attorneys. A lot of our lawsuits are also co-counseled with private law firms who generously give up their time um, to work with us and help us with these lawsuits. Coming off of the legal work you do, do you, have you seen like progress or like regress in how the state handles your cases and views your advocacy? Both, both. I think um, there's people that are fully included that have um, pretty severe disabilities and, and should be. Um, and then um, other other policies or other things that are regressive right now, though the current governor um, seems very committed to full inclusion. So um, we're gonna see where that goes. Not as much, I think, in Maryland, although you know, with the prison system, that is something that really needs reform. I mean, people with behavioral health needs should not be in prison because of their behaviors. So that that continues to be a big problem. And apparently the population has increased, not decreased. So 
Yeah. We will see. That. Thank you so much for meeting with me. I really enjoy talking with you. Yeah. So my my last question for you is: Do you have any advice for someone who wants to advocate for people with disabilities? Sure. <laughs> um, I would say um, that it's it's a very rewarding experience, um, and you meet wonderful people um, doing this, and. Um, there's really different different ways that you can do this, and so it's it's what um, really you would feel passionate about. So if you feel passionate about going the legal route, you could do that. You could do it. You could be a legislator and be a champion for people with disabilities. You can work within state or federal government and be a champion um, for people with disabilities. So. Um, you can, work in nonprofit organizations, you can have a social work degree, which that's what I started out. So there's many avenues to be a champion for people with disabilities, and it really depends on what what is your area of interest, where your talents and skills are. Um, but there's there's no, um, no lack of different opportunities for people who want to have a disability community needs, and they're, they're rich and vibrant and really fun to be a part of. Thank you so much for talking with me. I enjoyed hearing all that you had to say and it really gave me an interesting perspective. On yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.